Hey, okay. I wasn't as nervous tonight, so I that I would mess it all up. So I actually didn't jump in a minute early. Uh, so I am here exactly on time at five o'clock instead of a few minutes before. And I'm just going to make sure that I have, uh, let's see, everything set here. And da, 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 da. let's make sure that I do. Okay, good. Oh, I was afraid. The chats have been coming and going and disappearing. And I know some folks are still having some trouble getting um, getting into the chats. So with, I guess, not logging on or not being uh, being logged on in, in advance. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, everything was good to go. And I also want to make sure that I am, and I think I am. Yeah, okay, good. That I am in the right one because I set up next week's as well uh, to post with the Q&A that's going to be broadcast part one um, on Facebook at seven o'clock tonight. So I wanted to make sure I didn't log into next week's chat by accident or next week's live. So I see some folks coming on board now. I'm so glad you could join me. I know it's a holiday weekend. I actually have a timer. I'm going to set it because last week I just went too long. So I want to make sure that I'm respectful of your time. I really want these to be short, sweet, quick nuggets that you can just keep having your head and then jump in and be armed and ready for Monday morning. So I'm so thrilled. I see lots of folks coming on. Um, I have my timer set. So I'm going to talk for 15 minutes and then I'm going to answer questions for 15 minutes and I'm going to follow this timer. So no matter what I'm in the middle of saying, I will stop at 15 minutes. Now, what I want to do while you all are kind of still jumping online, and I am so, so, so glad that you could join me for this holiday weekend. Um, I thought because the whole focus, there's so many ways we can go with the secrets, because if you use secret stories or if you teach with the brain in mind, if you teach reading specifically with the brain in mind and by reading, I mean the most basic code, then you're really going against the norm as far as how typically reading sounds, which is it just is, it just does. You just have to remember when it comes to letters and sounds and patterns. That is often what we say at the absolute earliest grade levels. Again, when our kids are concrete thinkers licking the carpet and they're not quite ready to understand the morphology behind roots and, and why things might be the way they are with a code that they don't even have yet. So by going against the grain, teaching with the brain in mind, you open up a whole new world and that world's got so many places to play and to talk about and to explore. And I think that's why I have trouble focusing in these 15 minute blurbs because there's so many different directions you can go and everything takes you somewhere else. Much like when you're using the secrets in the classroom, you might plan on telling a secret just to help them read a short E word or a short and lazy E word or to know that a, that a vowel is going to be short or long because there's a babysitter vowel one letter away. And yet then that leads into another discussion that is completely unrelated to that particular secret, but opens up the door to maybe another one or um, looking at it backwards for the purpose of writing instead of reading. So just like you run with those teachable moments and your reading and writing begins to take form um, almost like a playground for critical thinking, these, these secret Sundays do too, at least for me. They're like a playground to let my brain just kind of go in a million directions. Um, and then you all don't help because your chats are usually as or more interesting than what I'm trying to say because I'm, I'm looking at things you're saying and thinking, wow, that's a great idea or goodness, I never even thought of that or oh my gosh, that is a perfect way to do such and such. So it's like two simultaneously valuable golden nuggets kind of happening at the same time. And while they're completely interconnected, I can't always digest all the really amazing things you all are tossing out between yourselves until after uh, the, the, the live is over. So that'll be a whole nother post in and of itself are those little golden nuggets that are harvested out of the chats. So back on task, I think I've lost about four minutes, but I, I'm happy I have so many of you here with the holiday. So yay, thank you. Better alphabet. The very first most basic way to cheat the brain. <laughs> Thank you for saying I can talk all I want. My husband never says that. Um, the very first most basic way to cheat the brain, or at least the most most um, most needed um, brain cheat first, if you're teaching kids, whether they're ELL or at the earliest grade level, is to figure out how to give them the not so valuable but incredibly important individual letters and sounds. The individual letters and sounds are kind of like the bread on a sandwich. They don't really, you know, you wouldn't want that for your whole meal because there's nothing to it and you can't really do anything with a bunch of bread, but you're not going to have a very good sandwich if you have a hunk of meat, cheese and mayonnaise and you don't have anything to put it on. You need something on either side of the meat in order to make it what it is, which is something that's worth having. And that's really how those individual letter sounds are. They can suck up your whole entire year if you teach 
early grades, um, if you teach kindergarten especially, or pre-K even more, because they do require a readiness with the higher level executive processing center. And that is certainly not built yet. It is absolutely not complete until about the early to mid twenties, but even the area that we need to knock on the front door and get a T or a K or a B that we're holding up on a flashcard into their little heads, that door may not be open. That door may not be built. That student may not have pulled a permit yet to build the door that hasn't been built. So you could be waiting a very long time on that front door to open. The back door is our key as always, but in the case of the Better Alphabet song, we're not taking social emotional roots. The social emotional roots that we could take for the, better, for the letter sounds would lead us down a path of having to have 26 more stories. And I am always of the mind, maybe because I am so easily distracted, that when you put too many things together, it gets convoluted and confusing. And kids can get caught up and lost in a story and forget the reason they're using it, which is to figure out that word on the page or to write whatever it is that they want to use in the story that they want to tell. So because of that, there had to be a different way for those better for those individual letters. They're important. Kids need them, but they can't do much with them unless they have the secrets. So they need both and they need to rise like a flood simultaneously. One powers up the other. The only reason kids know there's a secret is when they see letters that aren't doing what they should. If they don't know what the letters are supposed to do, then there are no bells and whistles go off letting them know, hey, there's a secret in that word. So you really do want to keep yourself honest. And as soon as you're telling them to expect A to say A or A, and then you're going to point to your calendar where it says, ah, you want to have a very good logical explanation for why you just said something that looked like a big fat lie, but it's not. There's just a secret that you don't know. And because it's a secret, you can actually toss it out on the very first day, even if it's pre-K. It doesn't matter. It's just a story. But it keeps you honest, especially to the one kid who might actually be paying attention to what you're saying. And he's noticing that you're not making any sense. So we always want to keep it, keep it honest, keep it logical, keep it in line with the brain's way of doing things, which is that it is a pattern making machine. So we want to feed the pattern making machine. We don't want to jam the pattern making machine. So all of that to say the better alphabet song are the easiest, fastest, it, it is the easiest, fastest way to capture those individual letter sounds without needing stories to go with them. You aren't, you don't need secrets for the better out for the individual letters and sounds because when a K says K, hallelujah, he's doing what he should. When a D says D, thank the Lord. That's exactly what he should be. So we're so happy when letters do what they should that we don't need a secret. Secrets explain what letters do when they don't do what they should. When they do what they should, all's right with the world. Doesn't make them any easier to teach, which is why we have this song. The song uses a different backdoor route, which is muscle memory, lips, tongue, teeth. Um, again, the brain develops back to front and the earlier developing centers are the area actually that will uh, attend to pitch, rhythm and intonation. So pitch, rhythm and intonation are our best friends when it comes to capturing information. We know this as teachers because we teach it. Well, I won't say we teach. We capture a lot of information through songs. We can capture the 12 months of the year. We can capture the seven days of the week. We can do all kinds of things with songs, but we also know the downside to capturing information with songs. And that is, it's a read only disc. That means kids can tell you, they can sing all 12 months of the year and they can get that probably in the first week of school if you sing it every day. Problem is they can't tell you what comes before July unless they sing the entire song from beginning to end because it is locked in place with repetitive pitch rhythm and intonation and the part of the brain that takes it in, which is this more primitive area of the brain that is earlier developing, but it has no ability to manipulate that information and pull out, twist around, put together in a different way. That's higher level processing. And the higher level processing again is the front door. That's the part of the brain that can take forever to learn a D. So if we're gonna go through the back door, we have to know that anything we put in there that's repetitive pitch rhythm and intonation will immediately be taken in easily, but not be able to be processed, which is why we're gonna cheat. All we have to do is chop up the song into 26 mini songs. That way the brain doesn't pull it together in such a way that we have to sing the whole thing to remember what else is, or to pull the sound for W. Kids can sing right on the letter they need and up will come the sound that they want. And they don't have to start at the very beginning and go all the way to the end. So it's a really cool way to look at the brain as a chess opponent. And if you know your opponent, then you can anticipate what it will do so that you can have a workaround all ready to go. And that's really where I love to use the brain science. That's why the title of this video and the next few that are going to be in the series 
are going to be uh, cheating the brain, cheating the brain for reading, not always in the same way, not always using the same basic brain law to cheat. Sometimes it's novelty. Sometimes it's um, uh, triggering those emotional social networks. Sometimes it might be um, what's used together is fused together, harnessing that power of, uh, of uh, plasticity. There are lots of ways to cheat the brain, but they all require you knowing something about your opponent and how it will how it will take what you're giving and where it's going to go from there. So that if where it's going to go is not a place you want to be, you can uh, have a workaround ready to go. That's my crazy dog. I'm hoping he doesn't keep doing that while we're talking. Um, and he is. So we're going to just ignore for right now. Um, anyway, so I'll pretend I'm in a classroom. So I'm going to show you by starting this out. And in a minute, I just might have to yell at her. Um, my dog's actually her. I said his, his he, Izzy, stop. Okay. Hopefully that'll work. Um, I'm going to start this letter, but actually I think what I'm going to do for time's sake, because so I'm going to stay honest, I've got five minutes. What I want to do is talk more about it so that I frame it. And then next week I can actually just do it. There are some links to actually see it done in this uh, description. So you'll be able to see those and actually get a step ahead of me if you want next week, if you're sitting there thinking, I just wanted to show it to me, but I want to make sure that before I do show it to you, I, um, tell you that the, the core pieces that make it really work. And you'll see these hit again in the third link that is actually a blog post um, because it's talked about there. The two pieces that are key when you're gonna use muscle memory as your access route for capturing these letters and sounds are going to be eye glue and muscle mouth, at least for our purposes. Muscle mouth, for obvious reasons, we're using motor memory. If we're going to use muscle memory, lips, tongue, and teeth, which is the way that kids can capture all the songs we sing for every other purpose at the early grades, then kids obviously need to really, really engage those muscles in order to let that be the, um, the retrieval uh, force. If we're going to rely on those um, those areas, those connections to capture those sounds, and kids really need to work their lips, tongue, and teeth. And the best way to get them to do that is to demonstrate what that over-exaggeration looks like. B says b -b 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 and C says but it can also say Now, you'll notice that I'm pointing to nothing. But if I were in my classroom, I would be pointing to both the capital and lowercase together simultaneously that's on your alphabet train. Now that's really important, especially I know pre-K sometimes just has capital letters. That doesn't help. You want capital and lowercase side by side as most alphabet trains have. And you're just pointing to it as a whole, as an entity. So you're not pointing to one and then the other. You're just referencing the two together because kids know that's a B, both. That's a B. But what's really, 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 really key is that their eyes are glued to your finger because they have to see what they sing and sing what they see. Half the battle with reading is seeing the symbol, knowing the sound. And when you see the sound and you know the symbol, actually I said that backward. Reading is see the symbol, know the sound. Writing is hear the sound, know that symbol. So in order to really cement the symbol sound relationship, kids can't be floating all over the floor and kicking their neighbor. Because what will happen is they will sing this song and they will know every single sound a letter can make, but they won't have a clue what any of those letters look like, which means you'll get zero transfer for reading and writing. And of course, there's no reason we're doing any of this other than use it for reading, use it for writing. Now, of course, we need secrets to power these up because a T is no more important than a TH. But you want to make sure you get the brain bang for your buck. And so singing this requires eye glue and muscle mouth. There's a clip also in the description that is of a pre-K class showing how easy this can be and how fast it can work, even with kids that are only about this tall. And they're as insane as any pre-K class you would expect to see, which is what I love about them, because when the song starts, they shift gears. They look like college students because they have been trained that this is eye glue time. This is muscle mouth time. And they just look like they're just they look like little West Point cadets following their teacher's finger. Now, having said that. Um, they do do one thing that I want you to keep in mind when you're watching because it's kind of a no-no, but you know, they're pre-K and I don't know them. I've never been to their class, so I'm just impressed with what they've done. But they do go a little crazy with the uh sound. So there is a shadow schwa sound. You'll hear a slight shadow schwa even in the better alphabet for reasons that are actually intentional. And there's a notation in the book about why. But they kind of take it and run wild with it. So you hear a big uh sound after some of those consonants. It's not going to cause an issue with what they're going to be doing with it. And there's been a lot of research that's backtracked are cutting it off, but like we were taught in college, never to have any uh, come out. 
a shadow schwa is actually useful. And for reasons that maybe that'll be added to the next one when I do it, but just don't mimic or use that as a model for the way that you want to sing those letter sounds. But it is a fascinating watch to see the eye glue and the muscle mouth in action, both of which you could give awards for. I like to do boys against girls and see who wins eye glue, who wins muscle mouth. Some days girls take away both, which means maybe they get to go to lunch first and uh, pick recess equipment first. Or maybe boys won one and the girls won the other. It's a good way to keep that composite competition going and really make sure that the focus remains on eye glue, muscle mouth when you're singing this song. Okay, now it is 5.15. I actually cheated. I gave myself one extra minute before my alarm was going to go off in case I couldn't be quiet. Um, so I am good with at least what I think I wanted to lay out with this better alphabet. Um, find the links in the description. I'm going to hit some questions now, but find those links in the description and then um, you'll kind of get a good flesh out of what we were talking about and you'll be in great shape for next week when I will demonstrate it. And I'm thinking next week because I'm probably going to need to hit those short and lazy vowel sounds and sneaky Y in order for you to know what my hands are doing with the better alphabet. Um, this may end up being a three part series on the better alphabet because next week you'll have to see the, the short and lazy uh, vowel sounds along with the uh, Sneaky white, and then you'll be all set to go, and we can just run wild with the actual song itself after that. So that'll be our track as we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and answer some questions. And every single week, I see the most amazing comments and questions. I think two weeks I lost the chat, like somehow they just disappeared and it won't come up. But so that you know, I've been really mindful now because the chats are so valuable, and the information that you all are sharing is equal or sometimes better, I think, than what I'm saying. Um, you can always reactivate the chat and display it after the video is over and it will run simultaneously with the video, which is really awesome. And I, I put in information on how to make that happen so that you don't miss, or if you have missed any, you don't miss the stuff in the chats because that's really where the good stuff is. Um, okay, and I'm just gonna see if I can scan for questions. Please feel free also to throw some at the bottom. I am really trying to focus on Q&A and I'm trying to cut answers down to 30 seconds to a minute, which you'll see on the big uh, premiere of the Q&A tonight on Facebook with Jen Foster. Um, so that's also another great place to toss questions into those comments because I'll answer them live um, in little video vignettes, like the ones you'll see there that are gonna come out at seven o'clock tonight. Okay. Um, Oh, I love that. So glad. And you know, that's some, I'm reading what Kendra was saying. If you miss the lives that it's, they're on YouTube. That's why I don't do them on Facebook. It's too hard to find what you're looking for and they're not as organized um, and as easy to grab. So you can always miss it. Come back. Just make sure you activate that chat because truly that is where I feel like that's the head to the body. And there's so much great stuff there that you're not going to want to want to miss. So as long as you activate those chats, other than we're going to miss you because we won't get to see your questions live, but uh, but just you can always go back and recapture those. OK, talk as long as you want, please. Oh, that's so sorry. I really like that comment. Uh, my first time on Secret Sunday. Yay. I'm so glad it's your first time. And you can always go back. They're self-sufficient. That's not the right word. <clears throat> They're self-contained. So aside from perhaps this one, which is going to be there. Well, the games was a kind of a two part quasi series phonics games. This is going to be kind of a three part, but they're they're intended to be self-contained. So yeah, if you just grab one Secret Sunday, watch it while you're, you know, getting your teeth brushed or whatever, if you're like me. Um, I would say speed up the pace of it because you can set the speed to watch something that you want information from faster. But if you do that to one of my videos, it will turn into like a record that you set to 45 speed because I go so fast already. So sorry, that's probably not an option. Um, but you can go back to the first one and then just either watch them in order or just little snippets of them whenever you get a chance because there's really a lot of stuff packed into each one, especially with the comments. Okay, from California, I took one of your classes. Oh, yay, you were at the kindergarten reading class conference. Yay, that's awesome. I meant to say in both of those sessions that I'd be focusing on better alphabet today because I hated not to do that there but there was so much to get out to kind of get you ready for what you could play with on Monday. So I'm really glad you're here. Uh, okay. Oh, thank you. South Florida. Yay. That's where I'm going to head actually and be there for a few months this year. Um, okay. Please consider having the whole set of flashcards on TPT to save shipping costs. I wish I could. Um, yes, it will reach more people around the world, but <laughs> the problem is in not such a great way. We really can't put the visuals in a digital reproducible format because it has happened and it was a disaster and it, and it wasn't done intentionally. It was actually done without permission, uploaded to every single sharing site you could imagine, given away in every form and fashion you could think of. 
It was an absolute total disaster and it gave us a taste of what an, a complete mess it can be when you lose control of material. It becomes something else, it morphs into something with clip art, then it becomes something that's universal. You know, we have trademarks and copyrights on everything and you, you can't make copies of the graphics or the um, stories without it infringing on copyright. But that's why we try to create some things that cost, like those porta picks that are those placards. They're like two bucks, two dollars, I guess, and fifty cents. They're heavy, con uh, heavy cardboard, um, and they are trifolds. And uh, if I can find one in here while I'm talking, I will. But they, uh, they're cheap. They're actually produced at cost and sold in class sets of 25. And that's something that I think uh, Tara had done a post on about the best gift ever for kids because she just hadn't thought about giving them away. But they're so cheap that you can. Um, I mean, I say cheap; it's relative. We're not paid much as teachers, but but cheap. Or then you go into Kinko's and trying to make color copies on a trifold visual that's this big for kids to use all year. And if you can't give them away and they aren't expensive at two buck, two fifty or two forty a piece, then you can laminate them and they should last about three years. So I would love. We are working so hard to figure out how to get these to um, the Middle East, how to get them to you know Japan, how to get them everywhere that that um, we get requests for. And I apologize in advance, actually, for a lot of you that are Jen Foster's followers. Jen is from England, and she's teaching in Malaysia, and a lot of her followers are up. You know, Jen and I communicating. We're on opposite sides of the world, so when it's midnight here, it's it's like one. Uh, PM there and vice versa. So her followers on Instagram are, I know, trying to order things and the shipping is outrageous. Out, I mean, as much as the kit sometimes for the shipping to some of these places. And we're trying to eat at least a third, sometimes a half, just to try and get it into hands of teachers in different parts of the world. Um, but no matter what, the time it takes and the cost of it is just so high. So we are trying to see what we can do to get some distributors in some different areas. But as far as uploading it, which certainly seems like the most simple solution until you start pulling on those strings, then you realize what a disaster it can be. So if there's any, you know, if, if we can think of anything, we will. Um, but right now, the best we're trying to do is in Canada, Australia, you know, the UK, um, Eastern Eastern countries just trying to get uh, get some good distributors. But that's a great question. And boy, I know it's one we get so much. So and I apologize again in advance to anybody that orders, sees the shipping cost and thinks, what? But just know we're paying at least, in some cases, a third to a half of what you're paying to get it to get it to you. Or at least we're trying to kind of get that to be in, um, integrated into the system so that so that it's not possible for you to get. Um, OK, I see. Uh, I wish I could go to one of your classes. I am actually in New Jersey. I work with the Summit, Summit New Jersey um, schools. and. Uh, and I've been out there a few times and I'm going to the New York City um, AEYC, which I think it's on my schedule on the Secret Stories uh, website. If you go to www.thesecretstories.com and look at conferences and workshops. Um, and I think that's in two or three months. I'm not sure. And I've done school district workshops out there in New York. That was my old stomping ground in um, in. Uh, when I went to college. In New Jersey though, it's mainly been Summit or I think I also spoke at your reading con or your teaching conference, your, uh, at the NJAC education conference. So you can keep your eyes out for that as well. And I am also usually up in Maryland for the Maryland reading conference and, and some places nearby there. Um, I'll be in Boston uh, also at the reading conference. I'm doing a couple featured sessions out there this spring. So keep your eye on that. And then always, you know, I love going and doing school district PDs or even school site PDs. Um, where there's interest and uh, principals will contact me or district folks. And um, anytime I'm able to schedule those, I do. So you can find information on that as well, because I'd love to, you know, connect in person and um, have more than an hour, which, you know, with the conference is usually the most you're going to have. Um, oh, and I will also be at the National Title I, too, which I know a lot of you come in to from all over the world, not even just the, the United States. Um, and I'll be doing another featured lecture there. And that's one of the best conferences there are. So if you're going to be there, please, you know, shoot me a, a note or an email. Let me know. Um, I, I would love to, to be able to maybe meet up. OK, I can go. Let's see. I should put my glasses on and then I can see better. Uh, OK, I wish I could go. my kid arrived this week. <clears throat> Yay, having so much fun already. We are so ready to sing C-E-C-I-C-Y, C-E-G-I-G-Y. Yeah, that's a good one because that comes in really handy for a lot of stories. Even though you wouldn't think in first grade, E-C-I-C-Y, G-E-G-I-G-Y would be like on your plate because it's typically absolutely what we would think of as some second grade phonics skill. But boy, is that everywhere. So lots of bang for your buck for that one. And um, that's one I think that kind of if you have it and you own it, you can use it in 
so many places. I like to call those kind of phonic skills high leverage phonic skills because those are the ones you can twist and turn and flip and flop and they're just everywhere. Not as much C-E-C-I-C-Y because that's not a turn, flip and flop one. It is one that's everywhere, um, but like sneaky Y, babysitter vowels, the ones that just keep coming up that are almost in every single word and they are the triggers for which way to go. They're your compass. So those high leverage phonics skills are really a great place to start. And, and because they are thought of as complex, they're sometimes the least likely ones we would think to hit, especially in kinder, but even in first or at the beginning of second. Um, and yet they're the ones that give you the most mileage. And because we're taking them through the back door, they're no harder to teach than your sound is, which is usually one of the first ones that we start. So it's nice when that door opens up and it levels the playing field into this buffet where we can give them the most bang for the buck pieces of the code first and not have to wait and give them last. Much like those vowels, by the way, that I'm gonna talk about next week, those vowel sounds usually are very difficult. Research shows the short vowel sounds are the hardest things for early learners to capture, but they don't have to be if you're cheating and you're not teaching them the vowel sound. You're just a little old lady who can't hear, eh? Or you are uh, the you who's just not paying attention and pretending not to listen in class. Ah, uh, so vowel sounds become easy when they're not vowel sounds anymore. And when kids don't have to use lips, lip position, tongue position, mouth shape to get there, which are their weakest spots. When you avoid the landmines of auditory discrimination and auditory um, uh, processing and articulation, and you just shoot through the back door where those, those um, blockades aren't in place, you can fly really fast. So anyway, all of that to say that C-E-C-S-U-I, I kind of see that in the same vein there. Um, we sing better alphabet song in first grade, first two weeks every day, then sing it off and on through the year. Yep, that's exactly how you do it. That better alphabet song, you know, that first couple weeks, I say two weeks to two months, it's not really two months. I think I've had maybe in all the years I've taught three students that would take all the way up to the end of that two months. Um, and one I will say was intermittent even throughout after that, but there were some some severe, um, some severe learning issues that were much more complex than your typical SLD, um, or mix that with non-English speaking, which was the case. So it it's that those are usually the cases where you need to continue and continue and continue and continue. You're still tossing out secrets and they're grabbing these bits and pieces, but smelling the coffee or connecting the dots with what they mean is where that slowdown can be. So for typical classrooms, and by typical, I don't mean high, um, highly affluent classrooms. I mean like your typical blue collar or title one classroom, that two weeks um, is, I dropped my glasses, um, that two weeks is more than enough uh, time to probably do it in whole group, unless you see some kids who need a little more and then you don't wanna send it off to small group, you can keep on doing it. But I think especially in first grade, that two weeks is a, uh, Good. Kindergarten, you're probably going to need to keep at it just to get the stragglers kind of continuing on. Got to go to these because my other ones went under the table. Hello from Indiana. Better alphabet song was a game changer this year. I was shocked. My kindergartners could tell me the different sounds of the letters um, and make uh, in, in month two. Yay. That is also the really cool part is you can't think out of the box if you don't know what's in it. So kids need every possible thing a letter can say when it's by itself. Not just these is cut or why says yeah, but everything a letter can do by itself, because only when they have that paired with the secrets that are kind of coming, you know, a few more this week, a few more next week, that's what lets them think out of the box when words present letters that don't seem to be doing what they should, like words like though or through, which are a couple examples that I used at the kindergarten reading conference with the GH and the sound it's supposed to make versus the one it was actually making in the word. You know, you can't think outside of the box, and here it is, and know that in the word though or through that the GH is going to say nothing unless you know what the only three things in the world are that GH can say. And if you know the secret about the only three things in the world that GH can say are, then it's not that hard to figure out the next most likely thing when one doesn't work. And lo and behold, it actually did make one of those three sounds in those words, though, through, can't think of any others, but there are thousands, well, not thousands. But anyway, it's right there. If you didn't know everything in this box about what GH could say, how would you ever think to try nothing when a letter didn't do what it should? So if GH didn't say the sound that it was supposed to in the word through, because GH is supposed to say F at the end. If it didn't, and you didn't know everything in this box, how would you ever know to try nothing for the word though or through? Who's gonna say, gee, that didn't work? I know what I'll try next. I'll try nothing and see if that works. That would be a random impossibility. 
But if there's, if you narrow it down and you know that the only three things on earth that can happen with this letter or with this secret are these things, then thinking out of the box isn't hard at all. It's just a matter of process of elimination, most likely next, most likely. So, and because we're using kid behavior to drive letter sound behavior, it's not even the next most likely of something they don't understand. It's next most likely of what they would do if they were there. Like the GH secret, if you don't know it, is all about standing in the line and how awesome it is, how great it is to be at the front of the line because you're going to get to g -g -g go first before anybody else gets to go. G you're going to get to go before anybody else goes because you're up here at the very front and this is so great to get to go first. G -g -g Ghostly, ghastly ghoul. At the end of the line, they're not any happier than we are. Man, we're so far. It's going to take us forever to get all the way up there to the front. <laughs> is the sound they make when they're at the end, like in rough, enough tough. And when they're in the middle, just like us, they say nothing because when we're surrounded by lots of people on both sides in a big long line, we just keep a low profile. We don't want to make a lot of noise and have other people have to listen to our conversation. So we pretty much stay quiet, just like GNH in words like sight, night, eight, fright. So always mimicking kid behavior, always giving them everything in the box and then letting them have that critical thinking playground to play the game of well, what else could it be? What else can we try? because they know all of the different possibilities. So talk about getting off on a tangent. Your comment about the Better Alphabet song made me think of that, which is yes, every single sound a letter can make by itself is covered. And that's so important to make sure that you leave no stone unturned because the code is nothing but thinking out of the box. Just when you think you know what letters are supposed to do by darn it, they do something totally different. And secret stories don't change that. They just give learners the base that they need of complete and total familiarity at the earliest possible time so that they can make sense of and start playing with the code. And that's where you start to see the really awesome thinking coming out, the great choices, the great ideas, the, the almost grade defying um, capabilities that get teachers so excited because we're not used to seeing kinders or first grade do things like this. And it's really just because we cheated. It's, it's not magic. We just, we just cheated. We gave them something in a way they shouldn't have had it at a time they weren't supposed to get it. And what they do with that is so mind boggling because we're not used to seeing it happening in these little teeny tiny learners. So, but I'm thrilled to know that, that that's going so fast. It really does work that fast. It's hard to believe it will until you jump in and just do it. So I love, I love seeing that and hearing that. And I would love for you to send me a video actually as well um, from Indiana. And by the way, uh, Amy from Indiana, I'll be at the uh, Indiana Power Summit for reading this uh, fall. It's one of the best conferences in the entire country because it's totally free for teachers and they give away thousands and thousands of dollars free. It's sponsored through Duke Energy. Um, and um, I was honored and thrilled to be asked to speak there this year. Um, some of my most I mean, some of the mentors that I've had for years have been there, Pamela Snow, um, Tim Shanahan, just, just some of the real kind of um, groundbreakers, especially with the brain research and reading, were some of the first people to, to speak there. I think they have four speakers every year, maybe six. I'm not sure. I think it's four. Um, but that's a great conference if you can go. And it's free if you get your energy from Duke Energy, which I don't know if that's like the whole state or just parts of the state. But if you don't, I think you can still get on a waiting list to get to come. Um, our kindergarten teachers did a great job, but I want to finish giving the students as many sounds as possible now. Yeah. Yeah. And kindergarten teachers still, I think it's a real mind shift for them to think that they can just toss out everything. That's actually why I posted and I reposted it tonight. Um, Mrs. Melissa Gregory's kindergarten class, she did something I wouldn't have even thought to do. And when she first told me, I was kind of freaked out by it, which is she does all of the secrets every single day. And she does it with this big book. She's going to send me a, um, what's well, it's a big book of the posters put together because she's got another set on her walls. And I couldn't believe what she sent me in October. I'd never seen anything like that before because I always treated the secrets like a buffet, which she does as well for reading and writing. But the kids really like to run through the secrets like they run through the better alphabet. So she sent me what they did and I just was, my jaw was on the floor. So what I wanted to, to show, I knew what she was doing on her end, but the, everybody else that saw it, that didn't know what the secrets were, were wondering what is she holding up that the kids are using to prompt them to be able to just retrieve every single thing that a letter can do, literally every single secret. So if you didn't know the secrets, it really looked like a weird card trick of some sort. So she's videotaping from the other angle so that you can see both sides of what's happening. And then she also posted preliminary test scores, which were awesome, just to show that transfer to reading and writing, that it's not a dog and pony show. It's not a skill and drill. The only reason we teach these things is so kids can use them to read and use them to write. And she had never taught kindergarten before. So she was an interesting 
person because she'd always taught first. So for her, uh, she went to kindergarten and really had no idea where to start, how much would be too much, what would be too little. So she just started throwing out stories and seeing where the ball fell and had no no boundaries. And wow, wow, it, that's it's just been incredible what's been going on on that end. So if your kindergarten teachers want to check out that Facebook post, um, you'll see it. I think it's the second one down right now. And uh, I'll probably pin it at some point again, um, especially once I get her follow-up test scores. But you can see what they were in December because she had sent something in. And I think that really gives teachers and kinder more courage and confidence to break the mold of what we would think we can do. And also to feel completely safe in the knowledge that it's all play. It's completely developmentally appropriate. It's all play. It's all stories. It's all fun. It's all pretend. It's all drama. It's all the stuff kids live and die for and will actually reenact during their center time. So it's not more skills. It's less skills. It's not more. It's better. And, and that's just the best way to put it. It's not more. It's just better because it goes right with the way they um, do everything when they're, you know, in that whimsical play mindset. So anyway, Kinder's always my... That was where I spent the bulk of my time. So I know exactly how they think. And I completely get the concern about, you know, but maybe I shouldn't do that yet. First grade, y'all are on the fire. You don't have a chance. You don't have a choice. You've got to do as much as you can because your kids have to be reading and they got to really be reading a lot at a higher level. So so it's never hard to get kinder or get first grade teachers to just jump in head first. But um, kinder, boy, when they do, that's really where you see some things that just are just mind boggling. Um, okay, we do a zip around game with the letters and then sing the better alphabet song with the cards in any order. Okay, well, you realize you're gonna have to send me a video of that because that sounds amazing and really, really, really fun, Becky. And I have no visualization of how that would look. So please, please, please send that to me. Um, maybe tomorrow or the next day, you know, videotape it because I would love to see that and I'll share it here. Uh, next week and it'll maybe even try to add it on to that game post or put a link to it. Um, I would love to see that. That sounds awesome. Okay. Uh, let's see. I can never find the links you mentioned on here. They're, they're right. I would normally say, uh Oh, cause I usually screw it up, but they are in the description. So the description for this video, which when it ends, you will see it like the whole description with everything in it is there. Sometimes I change the title around. Um, but the description I've been the last few weeks, I've been putting the links in before the video because I've been a little bit more aware of what I knew I wanted to hit. So you'll see the links in the video. There are three there right now. If anything else pops up, then I might add those to it as well. But right now there are three that you will see and uh, they're in there. And also I should always mention, please be sure to like if you can and subscribe the video because what that does is it um, allows it to do something. Actually, I don't even remember what it does, but it's important. I don't know why exactly, but I, I think it has something to do with the way it shows up so that it pops up when you type in that content first. And then that way it's, it's more findable, I believe. I think that's what it is. Um, anyway, and my buzzer went off, but I'm just going to see if I can make it through these. Um, is the Better Alphabet Song part of the kit? Absolutely. It's in the CD. Better Alphabet Song, it's not. You don't need posters for it other than the posters you have. And there are directions about putting those posters up above the uh, sounds that are in that Better Alphabet, like those vowels, like the sneaky Y, and even the QU. Um, I made a Better Alphabet poster chart, which I'll talk about next week. You don't need to have it at all because you'll have if you have the kit you've got those secret story posters to put up with your existing alphabet but next week when i talk about making sure your alphabet is accurate with the letters and the sounds meaning you don't have a xylophone next to the x or an oyster next to the o um that i've made it to make sure everything stayed true to sound because you don't want to send kids on a wild goose chase with the least likely sound a letter is going to make they need the most likely sound and then the next most likely so um but anyway, good question. But yes, everything that is needed to implement is in the kit, whichever kit you choose, everything. If you are in kinder, I would implore you to use one of the bigger poster size kits like the fun and funky or even the decorative squares. Or if you are are good at cutting things out or you want to back them because sometimes teachers will buy the original posters and then just slap them up and there's no visual border there. So those original posters are meant to be cut down in size and then posted um, on a on a background so that there's a visual yellow or some kind of way to differentiate from one to the other. They're really for just teachers in a pinch with space. Um, but ideally, if you're in kinder, these will be the most used reference tool in your classroom. Kids will use those anchors more than every other thing you have up on your walls combined in total and they'll use them all day long. And because we read and write across the entire 
classroom for a variety of purposes, they'll need to be able to see them visually everywhere. So you want the bigger ones, the biggest size ones you can get. And it always just kind of breaks my heart when I see, if I go to a school district and I see kindergarten and they've got those little space savers up on the, up on the um, wall or worse yet, like the flashcards, kids will never use them. They'll, they'll tell you the story. They'll have a good time with the story. But then when they go to write a word, they're just going to write it however they think. They will never have the the um, the attention span at five and at six years old to, to struggle to find something and then get out of their seat, nor would you want them to, to look to see how to sound out or spell or read every single sound. It's got to be easy, quick, visually accessible from wherever they are in the classroom. So size is really important when it comes to early grades. Space savers are fine for upper or for resource rooms, but visual accessibility is really the key there. Um, Okay, you guys are already talking about cool stuff that I'm missing and that looks really neat here. Uh, new students started after Christmas break. He had no knowledge of secret stories. My lovely first graders are teaching them to him. Yay, yeah, that's, and that's part of why you wanna always retell the secret, retell the secret, or let the kids retell the secret because it is like a merry-go-round and kids need to be able to just jump on. And even the kids who've been in your class, you know, some might've just started to see the connection between the secret and the text. So you always wanna keep revisiting, retelling. Secrets never go away. You know, they're told, they're retold, they're shared, they're reshared. They're they're like that program in the background of the computer that's always there, always teaching, always running. It's never stopping. So it's perfect when new kids come in, but even your kids who are all over the map, which they always are, you know, different kids plug in things at different times. And the telling and the retelling, sharing and the resharing are just uh, key to, to do all the way, you know, through that year. Um, okay. Uh, prompt. Okay. Oh, you guys are asking such great questions. Um, okay. And I'm going to try to scoot through. I may have to in keeping with my time, although y'all are always welcome to log off whenever you need to. I always am torn between answering questions and being good with your time. Um, we sing the better alphabet song in first grade. Okay. Sing it off and on for run. I already read those. We do a zip around. That's the one I want to see a video of. I teach preschool children letters uh, all, You're with your song. The key is to pair it with the alphabet chart. Absolutely. As a formal reading recovery, former reading recovery CIM teacher, I paired it with our ABC charts. Yeah, you have to. The songs, any song, you know, the whole point, it's not, you know, the whole reason reading, if you're going to sing a dinosaur song, you know, I guess you don't necessarily need to be pointing to each dinosaur unless the goal of the game is they can instantly tell you what the dinosaur is. But, you know, if you're going to sing a normal song, the song is the purpose and maybe the information that's in it is is what you want to get across but when you're singing the better alphabet song you're trying to get two things across and they're not directly related naturally which is the sound to the symbol the symbol to the sound and the only way to fuse those two things together is make sure that when your eyes are seeing it your mouth is saying it and when your mouth is saying it your eyes are seeing it and it's hard to get kids to focus that intently for that long of a song um, and in order to make that connection um, cement, I actually was looking at a post and we were talking about this in kinder. Normally you always wanna move and incorporate motion and movement into learning, but not with the Better Alphabet Song. With the Better Alphabet Song, if you are, and I use this example of the zoophonics because there's in one of the posts that has the link in the description, the teacher was saying, forgive the fact that you'll see my kids doing zoophonics motions with the better alphabet. She said, in retrospect, this hurt more than it helped. We were doing this because we got the secret stories in the middle part of the year and we'd already been doing the zoophonics. So we just thought, well, we'll mush them together. And usually with the secrets, that's perfect. You can mush the secrets into anything you're doing because they're just the fuel to fire up the journey. But because the, the, the visual acuity for that sound symbol connection is just so key to being able to transfer this to reading and writing. Anything that disrupts that visual auditory connection basically defeats the purpose of what you're trying to do. So when your kids are flapping around with the alligator mouth or pretending they have the elephant ears, all those things are just added likelihoods to them getting off track with see this sound to symbol, symbol to sound see what you're saying, sing what you see. If we want their eyes to be glued to the letter symbols as we're singing their sounds, if my neighbor's flapping around like an elephant, he looks really interesting, much more interesting than that D does. So I'm gonna look at him. So any kind of motions like that during that song only will hurt more than they were helped. Now that is with the exception of those vowels. They have to do the motions for those superhero vowels and their short and lazy sounds because that's how they're actually getting the sounds. The only way they're gonna find that eh, is because they are the little old lady who can't hear. Or the ah uh, is because they are 
short you who pretends not to pay attention and doesn't know the answer. So those gestures are critical because that's what's going to land them in the sound that they need. Without those gestures, they wouldn't be able to find the sound because muscle memory won't work for the vowels. Uh, 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 there's not enough variance between the lips, tongue, and teeth for muscles to reliably capture them. So we had to have a different route. And the route we took was a dramatic action that lands kids directly in what happens to be the perfectly hooked short vowel sound. So those vowel sounds are the exception. But I mentioned that, um, I don't even know why I mentioned it now because I've already forgotten the question. <laughs> But anyway, um, I'm sure it went with it. Oh, because Pam was very correct, absolutely, to say the key is, of course, pair it with that alphabet chart. Alphabet chart. Um, I love seeing what they sing and uh, seeing what they see. Okay, never heard of add adding. And thank you, Helen. That's just the easiest way. I even tell the kids that you got to see what you sing and seeing what you see. Otherwise, you will not know when you see this sound or that letter. That sound won't pop out of your mouth. When you see this D, we want your mouth to go. Duh. We want it to be that fast, but it will not happen if you can't see what you're saying and seeing what you see. Kids understand that because they want to have super strong lips, tongue, and teeth muscles. They don't want to have puny little muscles when all their friends have great big ones. So that's why they have to use that muscle mouth and that eye glue. So they get it. They get really competitive, which you'll see with those pre-K kids. Um, that's why I actually post them just to show that they can be that focused and how important it is because, boy, they're hitting every single sounding cue. Um, we have never heard of adding the uh. Uh, might have a benefit. Uh, heard of. Yeah. And I'm not saying add the, uh, I want to make sure I'm clear on that. You don't want to add the, uh, you just don't want to be so militant with cutting it off. We were all in school, maybe 15, 20 years ago. And we were told, you know, don't say, uh, it's not b or r, it's, b or t s. <laughs> you know, cut, 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 cut. And the ILA actually went back on that and said, okay, whoa, now they're having trouble, um, blending. The initial reason for cutting it off was that they would have uh, trouble blending because they had the extra sound. Then when they cut it off so quickly so that it wasn't mimicking natural speech, then they were not hearing, you know, er ed, er ed, er ed, <laughs> and it's not, it's er ed. So there was kind of a happy medium and I'll talk about it next week, but it was to come to a short I sound, which, so they'd say r or b instead of r or b, thinking kids won't get as carried away. But that actually doesn't work if you're doing secrets because we teach vowels first, not last, because we're cheating the science that says they can't have them first. And we're going with the fact that they got to have them first because you can't read or write without a vowel. So if we cheat the science and if we do give them vowels first using these dramatic actions, then they're going to wonder why you're saying B, why they're going to say, why are you have an I after the, uh, the B? So the, 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 the front door approach would be to say kids won't know you have an I after the B because they won't know an I until after they've learned the B. But with secret stories, we don't we don't have to play by those rules. They get the vowels at the same time as the consonants, which actually they get them first because the vowels they can learn through a secret. It's fast. The consonants have to go through muscle memory. So because they get the vowels first, that that plan wouldn't work for us. So we try to just minimize the uh sound. We don't completely cut it, but we minimize it. The kids you're going to see in that link went to town with it. <laughs> and you don't want to do that because that is what then would be what the initial concerns were about blending. You don't want to go ba 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 ba. You just want it's okay to say you know ba 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 ba. ba. That's not going to hurt anything. But uh, when it starts to sound like you're singing ba ba, you know that's the concern, and it is airing on that side with the little pre Ks that you see. So you don't want to mimic that. And I'll I'll explain a lot more about that next week when I actually do it. Um, okay, uh, during a running record with my most quiet kindergartner, she came up to an unknown word and hummed. Mm, ah, uh, turned to me and said, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I'm not sure if I'm getting that. I I think I, I think I can kind of visualize what you're trying to say, but I'm not sure if I'm getting the right, the right thing. So if you have a follow-up to that, tell me, because if I'm not sure if you're saying she got it right or she got it wrong. Um, it is interesting to watch how they pull things back out because sometimes the way they pull it out is they're going in the right direction, but they don't really know why they're headed there. So um, like one teacher was testing her kids and asked if she knew what Y said. And the little girl said no. And the teacher started to make a line to show that she didn't. And then the little girl said, but but I do know. But I, I do know, though, that he's really bad. He's sneaky. And I know that anytime people see him, he does what he should because they'll go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I know when they can't see him, then it'll be really sneaky and they'll always go go e i i i i but i don't but i don't know a sound though so she proceeded in kinder to tell her teacher all the possible things that y could do which are positional sounds of y that a second grade assessment would have but she didn't understand that is the sound for y those are the sounds so again that's where that 
connecting the dots, that readiness, that developmental readiness that we're not trying to control. That's the part that's up to kids to kind of connect that. And that happens through modeling, lots of modeling so that she starts to see, oh, what I already know and understand about Sneaky Why, that's how I know the sound he makes in the word July. That's because he's being sneaky in that word. I get it because he's at the end. Or that's why in the word y- 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 yellow, he's he's not being sneaky because he has to do what he's supposed to because he's the line leader. So they'll know the whole secret. That part's developmentally perfectly friendly. It's the application of the secret to the reading and the writing that you see kids on a bell curve. That's a readiness issue. That's a wake up and smell the coffee issue. That's a, I'm done licking the shoe and playing with the carpet. And I actually think I get what you're doing over there. And I saw someone mention this because I saw Stacy's name and someone was talking about happening through modeling. And I'm guessing that was the conversation you were having. And that's absolutely the case. Modeling is the way to get those dots to connect. So you're not just putting the chicken salad out on the buffet. You're putting the chicken salad on the buffet and then you're talking about how delicious it is and you're showing how many times it comes in handy because you can mix it with the jello and you're there watching Johnny scarf it down. Or another analogy is you're giving him a key and that key is theirs. It's right there for them to use and to take, but they maybe don't understand what a key does to a door. So every opportunity that you have to show how this key, this secret, look, it's here. We can unlock this door with it. Let's see this word. This word is January E. And this word is boy. That's the boy's bathroom. Look at this big book. We've got sneaky Y in this word. What sound is he making? And if a kid goes, yeah, say, really? He's at the end. Do you think he's going to behave and do what he's supposed to when he's at the end of a word and doesn't think anyone can see him? Who can tell me the secret about sneaky Y and what he does when he's at the end of a word? So always modeling the connection. And that is part of what I mentioned last week about how I loved the post with <coughs> the secrets off the walls. Because when you can put your sight words, let's say, or the word by um, with, let's say, or, or the word, you know, her, and it, it's, 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 this is on a board. And then the word her is with a little line and the word her and another little line and the word were and another little line and the word turn. And who knows how many words that day you might come across where you need this key to unlock those doors. And rather than just pointing to the poster all the time that's on the wall, which you do wanna do, because you wanna show them where the hammer lives, where they can find the wrench, where they're gonna get that drill. So you don't wanna take your posters off the walls because they need to know where they are so they can have quick access when they're reading and writing at their seat. But you do wanna bring them into the, the exploratory world of playing with text all day. So I love the idea of if you have to use a particular key one day, you know, smack it up on the board. If you have these little cards or if you have even these little space savers, smack it or even those little the little cards in the back of your book that you have. Those are fine too. smack it up on the board and then collect. Be a little word collector. Collect the words that go with that key that you need the key to unlock. It's just a good visual for these concrete thinkers so that they really get the idea of these are keys that unlock doors that are locked and that I'm confronting all day long the lunch menu, you know, the the signs in the hallway. Everywhere I turn, I see words. And everywhere I see words, I see secrets. So that that's just that. It just makes that easier, I think. And it was a brilliant idea. Again, Tara Settle, brilliant idea um, or epiphany that, you know, she had to do that. I even had never, never thought of that. Um, we sing better alphabet song. Okay, I think my thing keeps going back up for some reason. I have no idea why. There's a TH... Uh, a th- th- and an er, er and another er that says mother bird she beam secrets truly work um oh okay <laughs> that's why the first comment didn't make sense as i didn't read it both parts i got it okay thank you uh, louise i'm sorry no wonder so i totally get it and that is awesome that is awesome mother bird i love it and you know and how do you know what you need until you need it and that's why when a district tells me and they do They say, would you please put these in a scope and sequence so that we can give the order that teachers are supposed to teach them? How could I possibly do that? You know, Arthur needs the AR and the TH and the ER to read his own darn name. And, you know, um, Louie, that maybe is spelled L-O-U-Y, he needs that sneaky Y. Tabitha is going to need the TH. So how could I possibly presume to tell you what you need to give your students to accomplish what you're gonna be dealing with all day long. That would be insane for me to say, give them this, but hold back that. So there there is no right order and no research has ever actually said there is a right order. The research just says explicit 
um, and systematic instruction. So Secret Stories is systematic and it is explicit, but the system it follows is the brain system, what I need. And the reason that it's not um, frowned upon from that research end is it's not a slowdown of the process. It's not just toss them out as kids need them over three to four grade level years. It's an acceleration of the process. The whole point of it is they can have more sooner, not less later. So, uh, but it does, again, it's always a backdoor world. It's a different way of thinking. So it's always a little bit outside the norm of, um, you have to read what the research says and then think about, but if I could breathe underwater, how does that apply? You know, vowels are supposed to be taught last. They're the hardest for kids to get because of auditory processing and articulation weakness. But if we're not using auditory processing and articulation weakness to find the sounds, if we're just a little lady who can't hear or someone who doesn't know the answer to a question, then do I have to delay them? Why would I delay them? Kids can't write anything without a vowel. They can't read anything without a vowel. So if I had a magical way to give them the vowels right from the get-go, of course I would. So that's the breathing underwater analogy that I always use is, you know, when you don't have to follow the rules, don't, <laughs> don't, because sometimes the rules just delay access to the code that kids need to do everything that we do all day long, every single day, across every single grade level. Um, okay, that's awesome, Louise. It is awesome, Louise. I'm sorry I massacred the intention of your <laughs> two-part question with my misunderstanding. I uh, would love to know about the, uh, why is it important not to model it, but it's important it's used. Um, I will talk about that next week because that's a good question and that's going to go, like I said, we have to hit the vowels in order to do the Better Alphabet song because you're going to see me doing those things and you're going to need to know what those are. So next week I will get into much more detail on that. It's something I wanted to do anyway, um, but it needs its own little, little, little component. So I promise Kim, I'm going to talk about that. You'll see a little bit of that though in the video link that's in the description. There's a vlog link um, to a vlog where I kind of get into some nooks and crannies of some things. Um, and you'll, if you want to kind of watch ahead, you can do that. And that'll give you the gist of, of where I'm going to head with that. Um, and again, it's in the link in the description. You're coming to South Florida. Yay. Yes, I will be living there. I was supposed to be there already. My mom is there and we promised her we'd spend a part of our year there. So I will be, but where we are, it's like little condo that we're going to be coming to for a few months out of the year. And it's, they're doing some stuff, the construction. So, uh, but I should be there like from March until at least April. So I'm really excited. And I'm going to be working with some schools and some school districts there um, while I'm there, of course, and still flying over to other places. Um, but if you're in the area and you want to pop over to something that's scheduled, that'd be awesome. Uh, Katie, is there a way we can see your schedule for conferences? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, the schedule's on the website. So it's secretstories.com under workshops and conferences. As far as conferences, you can join anything that's a hyperlink text, you can click on and, and go to. If it's not a hyperlink text because it's a district workshop, like I'm doing one in Raleigh. Um, I just did, well, I did, just did a conference in California, but before that I was in St. Actually, I take that back. After California, I went to St. Louis and I did a, a school district workshop for about 500 in um, Ohio. Is that right? Oh, Illinois. Um, and so anybody that was in a neighboring area that wanted to come, although they can't just come, if you reach out to me, I can reach out to the, in this case, it was the district director and just say, would you mind if a couple teachers from a neighboring, you know, district sat in and, and 99% of the time they're fine with it. The only time it's an issue is if it's a rural area and they have very few substitutes and one sub might pull from another group subs. Um, and then they sometimes worry about that, but otherwise they're usually pretty good about letting neighboring staff sit in as long as it's not like, you know, another 300 teachers, but like a grade group or grade shares. So anytime you don't see a hyperlink, if there's something near you and you want to ask me about it, shoot me a quick email and then I'll connect with whoever the district contact person is and uh, see if you can go to that. Otherwise conferences are straightforward. Those links take you right to the conference site and then you just register for the conference and you can go. I will say that I have seen, and it, it was just happened at, um, in California. I loved that there was a group of teachers there that all came just for the session. Um, and they'd been using the secrets for a long time. That was awesome. Uh, the only thing that I would always say is if there are things at the conference that you want to see specifically, yes, send a big group of teachers, go to the conference, but keep in mind that a session is an hour. A PD is a day. So it's all, and the PD usually I'll see earlier grades for about four hours in the morning, upper grades for about three hours in the afternoon because upper grades whole plug, early grades build. And that is so much more 
valuable as far as really understanding and digging into what we're doing and what you're going to do in the classroom than a one hour session. So rather than sending 10 teachers, let's say across the state to register and stay at a hotel for a conference, sometimes it's much less expensive to bring me to the school and then I'm there for an entire day or two days. Now, again, if you if it's a conference that you're going to go to or there's so many things you want to see, go because professional development is so important and getting so much new information from the sources is is just wonderful. It's a great experience and you can't get the same things online that you get in person. So I would never dissuade anybody from attending a conference ever, especially if it's one that's got meat, you know, not just like a rah, rah, hoo, ha kind of a thing, but a real meaty conference with folks that are really going to give you food to take and shift the game of learning in whatever the areas you struggle with are in your classroom. Um, but a PD sometimes is um, a better a better option for time's sake. And you, you can see information on that as well in those in that workshop link. So uh, please feel free. And, and you're also always welcome to reach out to me too if you just want any information about what it looks like or what the date availability might be or the cost. Um, okay, some of my lowest babies um, are uh, doing the better alphabet song. We're trying to recall the name of the letter closer to, yeah, that's that's awesome. That's really what they will do. And and you will see, and I do see that, that it seems like they take long to get the letter by singing the song, then they lose their focus or desire to sing the name. Okay, I, I think that makes sense. And I think what's going to make more sense is pairing what you're going to see those pre-k kids do in the link to the video in the description along with what i'm going to talk about next week because i think i know exactly the trap that you're falling into and it, it's connected to that eye glue muscle mouth because that is the absolute first trap door that can just put a big monkey wrench in the acceleration of the individual letters and sounds with the better alphabet it's actually why i make such a big deal now and jump up and down in the book about eye glue, muscle mouth, eye glue, muscle mouth, because they're not natural for early grade kids to have that focused attention. And yet if those two things aren't in place, it falls flat because you lose that connection of see the symbol, say the sound, hear the sound, see the symbol. And it's so easy for that connection to disappear. And what that does then is it turns it into something that's a lot like every other song you might use to teach the letter sounds, which can take longer. And we don't want that. We want this fast tracked. So we will hit that piece of it next week when we talk about those those um, kind of rules of thumb, but definitely take a peek at that pre-K group and you'll see, uh, I think you'll see exactly what I mean then when we put that together next week. Um, using trifolds at parent meetings and sending one home with parents who have struggling readers. Yeah, that's, that's awesome to do that. And even if you can send them home with all the kids, I mean, you know, the best thing I've seen schools do is have parent nights where the parents who come, instead of just giving them a hot dog and French fries, they get a porta pick and then they can use that with the, the multi siblings because every grade level where there are kids who maybe can't plow through unfamiliar text are hearing secrets. So, or if they're not at every grade level, then your student can certainly help their fourth grade sibling when they're trying to study for a spelling test and don't know why the word ridiculous has an O in it. So they can tell them the story about OUS or you know whatever they need or the C-E-I-C-I-C-Y uh, for the word ceiling or cyclone. Um, so that's a great way to, to kind of um, pull parents in, keep them in the learning loop. And you can also often use your school improvement funds for that because most school improvement plans have a requirement that you have a homeschool connection that you are fostering and supporting and funding. So what's really nice is not only have districts been able to purchase those better, those um, porta picks, which I think I can show you, but they can purchase those porta picks with their school improvement funds instead of taking it out of teacher funds. But the other really neat part is um, some of them have actually been able to have me come out for a PD using those school improvement funds because they'll have me slated for a parent night for their parents. And then I'll do like a workshop for teachers the next day. So in districts where they don't have a lot of professional development funding, but they do have funding that they have to use for parent support and homeschool connection. You know, that's been a really neat way to kind of kill a lot of birds with one stone. This is what those look like, by the way those porta picks and they're just little trifolds. They're kind of heavy duty so that you can laminate them and they, they last a while. Um, okay. That's a good idea. Kim summit is not far from me. Oh, my district school. Okay. Summit, uh, New Jersey there. Uh, Janice uh, Tierney is head over there. She's amazing. Her teachers probably know the secrets better than I do and use them with incredible success and have been forever. Janice has been doing the secrets since she was like, she's now like way high up there, but she was, I think just starting out as a principal, maybe 10 years ago, somewhere, I don't even think it was in New Jersey. Um, anyway, so they are like, you could go sit in on any of their classrooms, just maybe ask to speak with Janice Tierney, call the summit school board. They can 
connect you to her. She's over a few different campuses and um, you can probably sit in on any of those teachers classrooms and get a ton of um, learning and knowledge from the things they do. They've had trainings, they've had digging deeper trainings. And again, they're teaching me things I didn't think about. So they are uh, really rocking it. They use the Lucy Calkins writers and uh, readers workshop models. They do not use the phonics piece of that. They already have secret stories, which kind of goes farther and faster. I do like the Lucy Calkins phonics workshop model though for, um, I don't, I haven't seen it, but I like from what I've heard, I know um, some teachers that have told me they've seen it. And I like that it, it gives you more program-like activities, which I don't. So I, I don't, and I, I never have, but I like that if you wanted something that you wanted to be kind of told, here's what you can do and here's how you can do it and cut these pieces. And that I like that that's there for teachers who feel like they need to have more direction. Um, like, okay, I know CECICY secret. So now what do I do? Like, and I would say, you know, use it as a key to unlock all the words where you see that, you know, do a shared writing activity. You can even doctor it up if you really want to hit a secret for some particular reason by making sure that the poem has an opportunity to use it. Although I don't find you have to do that much because reading gives us a chance to use everything all the time anyway. Um, but, but I like that the workshop model maybe gives you a lot more, I won't call it busy stuff because it's not busy stuff. It's just lots of ways to skin a horse. And I like that, that it's there for teachers who might want to pull that in for different purposes. It's just like ready-made, you know, whatever, um, that you might need to really hone something. What I don't like is delaying learner access to the code. And while I do think that it accelerates it more than a typical reading series, it doesn't give them everything from the get-go. And to me, that's just key. That's just, it's just key, you know, first grade, you can't wait until first grade to get those, the babysitter vowels, um, you know, to understand what's up with words like, you know, three syllable words, you have to be able to know the triggers to know which way to go with those vowel sounds. Uh, but I, but I do, I do love how they use those workshop models. And then a lot of the school districts as well in, um, in, on the West coast will use uh, the cafe strategies. And that is very also open-ended in terms of a great framework or structure to, to turn again, the working with reading and writing as a playground and, and giving kids kind of parameters and structure to do that. So the secrets just fit perfectly in with that um, because they give kids a way to do the reading and writing. Otherwise you get the, the structure for the reading and writing, but you still don't know how to get the kid to read and write. Um, and actually Jen Jones and I were just talking about that as well, because she works with so many different schools and districts. And again, gives them great tools and structure, especially for things like reading, guided reading, Jen Jones of Hello Literacy. And um, she was saying, you know, phonics is always this, this missing piece that, you know, they can have a great structure for coordinating their guided reading groups and all the tools they need to do it. But then how do you get Johnny to actually read? You know, he's got to be able to read in order to do the activity that's part of this wonderful structure, whether it's cafe, you know, reader's workshop, writer's workshop, any of those things. Um, and that's why Secrets just needs to stay trim and lean and mean so that it can just sit inside of all these other things that you're spinning around in your day or in your district doing. Um, I've never heard of the National Title One. I will look into it. It is an amazing conference and your school, if you're a Title One school, it's it you can easily go there. Um, they will fly you all the way in and it's just, it's a phenomenal conference. They do have video on demand. So you can actually check out all the videos of presentations there. I think you do have to pay for those, but I know all of mine are on the YouTube channel. I've, I've spoken there as a featured speaker. Um, I do a featured lecture there and I think I've been there for the last three years in a row. This will be my fourth year, which I'm afraid I'll jinx myself if I say that out loud, I won't get to do it next year. Um, prior to that, I just did a couple times uh, back in like 2012, I think, and maybe 14. And then every year since uh, then. And um, it's, all of those are free. Those you can see on, because I, I put them up on uh, YouTube, which we're allowed to do. So you'll see different years marked by different colored dresses. That's how you'll know they're different years. Um, okay. And I know I'm over, but it's questions. So please feel free if you need to go. That's fine. I'm going to try to answer these though, because they're good ones. Uh, so thankful for the weekly uh, learning times was able to put in practice what I learned last week during the week. They love to pass the secret game. Yay. I would love for you guys to send me video clips of any of the stuff that you put into practice because I can say things like this, but there's nothing better than seeing it in real time in real classes with real kids. And there's, I mean, there it, it's ideal for me to be able to toss something out in a workshop and then play a quick two minute clip so that teachers just can really see exactly what it looks like. So I just would beg you, please, please, please. Um, my email is katie at katiegardner.com. And if you email me or if you wanna put it up on Facebook, whatever you wanna do, I would just be so grateful to have 
any of these cool things that you're doing in your classrooms. Uh, a prompt that I use is to ask students to look for chunks, secret stories, chunks, or chunks we see in other words. Yeah, that's great. I'm not sure what the answer to that was. I must have missed that part. Um, so I'll back up here. Something uh, they do have to return at the end of the year. Oh, yeah, uh, they have to return at the end of the year because they're expensive. They're about two dollars and fifty cents. And one of the things that we were thinking about when uh, Tara sent me that gift, best gift I ever gave, was you know I remember when I would buy the gifts for the kids to to a take home for themselves and B make for their parents. I would probably, I mean, you don't want to spend five, six, seven, eight dollars, but you end up spending five, six, seven, eight, sometimes ten dollars a kid because you're trying to buy the frames and the puzzle pieces and paint and the so you're by the time you get the parent gifts that kids have to make and then the kid gifts that you have to get or create, it, it's costly. So what's really neat is this is, you know, when they have the ability to take the the code crackers um, which is what we would call these porta picks, the code crackers home. It's a gift for parents and teachers. And I think that Tara really fleshed that out when she talked about that she wanted to make sure the parents knew that this was a valuable gift, that this was a gift for them to give them a hands-on tool to really not be confused or afraid of how to respond when their kids don't know how to read a word, that they, they have what they need. They don't have to even know all the secrets, but they have to know there are secrets. And then they can say, do you see a secret in that word? Let's look at the crack code cracker. Where's your code cracker? And what's nice is I think mid-year, whether it's Christmas or Valentine's Day, this is a good time because they won't take it for granted. The kids think these things are amazing. So to have the ability to take them home is mind boggling. And the parents understand that there are these things called secrets, albeit they may not know what they are, how they work. So it's a good time where their value would be um, realized. And um, and I think it becomes a cheap gift then because it's $2.50 a kid. Um, so I think in that regard, it was a brilliant idea to just mesh that together with a time of the year where you have to buy something anyway. Um, and then in her case, she was lucky. She's a Title I school. So they buy a new set every year for the, they, they can, they don't, but they can buy a new set every year um, using the hundred dollars that they get, uh, or hundred and fifty dollars that they get for their Title One monies. Um, okay, uh, da, 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 da. the uh, uh, National Title One maybe in the near future. Go to Eastern Washington. You know, I would love to go to Washington. I was just in Washington for something. I don't remember what it was. I think it's Maryland, um, but I'll be in Boston soon, and I think. I may even have something coming up in Washington that my schedule's not totally put up yet. It's partially put up. So just keep an eye on that. And if there are any conferences that you know of, sometimes I'll go to conferences because teachers will tell me to. They'll say, hey, we got this such and such conference here. And, you know, all of our early teachers go or all of our reading um, uh, support focus, you know, folks go. And we would really like you to speak here. And the person that does it, her name is Marilyn. And here's her email. And um, and I always reach out and I'll send a video clip and say, hey, I, you know, I if I have it in my schedule, if it's a whole um, and then sometimes I'll go out and there's you know not even a charge to go. If I'm asking to go, if I'm invited to go to a conference, then they usually pay me as a speaker. But if I ask to go, as long as they can work with my schedule, um, you know, I, I love to go to places I've not gone in terms of a conference and see teachers that I don't normally see. So if you are privy to certain things that are happening around that area that you attend, um, or that you want me to look into, certainly just reach out, let me know. Otherwise, like I said, check that workshop um, schedule because sometimes you can do PDs or district things and have me uh, have me there. Um, okay, and see if I can just jump through anything that's left here. All of the, left, wait, all of the alphabet sounds in just two months? Yay, yeah, Rosemary, all the alphabet sounds in two months. I don't mean all the phonics patterns. I don't mean all the secrets. I mean all the individual letter sounds. So when you're singing the ABC song and kids take forever to know that a case is cut, a D is done, a W doesn't say dub, but it does say what, all those sounds. And every single sound that letters make in the most likely order. So C would say K and S, G would say G and J, Y would say Y and E and I. All of those sounds, two weeks to two months. And it's really more like one month. But I say two to two weeks to two months just to give you that that spectrum. And if you're new and you're just tuning in or you just are hearing this for the first time tonight, that is not the time you wait to tell secrets. So don't think, oh, okay, so I'm supposed to do that first and then tell secrets. No, no, no. You start telling secrets simultaneously to that muscle memory, better alphabet song. Kids need both. A T isn't helpful without a TH. You need both to do anything with them. So they're totally not contingent on one another. You, you're singing a better alphabet song while you're 
unlocking words with secrets. I had a new student start over Christmas break. He had no knowledge of the secrets and I already read that one. Uh, GH in the middle, they don't know what sound to make when they hang out in the middle, G or F, so they say nothing at all. Yep, okay, I see you guys are already helping each other in here, which is awesome. Use secret stories with wipe off boards before, during, and after reading is great. Underline secret stories chunks to break unknown words, helpful before pronouncing. Yeah, we would call that like a secret story hunt. Just, you know, go on a secret story hunt before we you know, read this page or read this little guided reader so they could go in and highlight or underline um, in, you know, the book if they're allowed to write in the book or if it's a photocopyable book um, so that they could see them. Again, that visual acuity is half the battle and making that part easier for them by just having that highlighted helps. I did that with the guided readers that are on Teacher Pay Teachers. You, you can use secrets with anything. That's why I'm so hesitant to make stuff, which is why I said that, you know, the the workshop materials sometimes are helpful um, with the Reader's Writer's Workshop. But um, on TPT, I did make some guided readers more or less just to give you a roadmap on how you can hunt for secrets in any guided reader. I did it for you in those because I highlighted them in a different color. I put outlaw words with these little prison bar looking things. And then I made little notes at the bottom to help you get through certain words that maybe would give you pause to know how to go which way or the other with a secret, like though, or like through, like we talked about before. So those guided readers that you see on the teacher pay teacher page give you kind of an idea of how to just easily just kind of mesh this into the reading and writing you do all day long, but anything you're reading, they apply to. And using those whiteboards is a great way to do it, especially if you can't write, you know, in your or guided reader books. Um, I love your secret stories. I see it working with my ALL kids in South Korea. Oh, wow, that's awesome. They're recognizing the sounds. Again, I would love video, um, especially in these other countries. I, I get so many great um, things. I had a teacher from Japan working with uh, uh, Japanese students and teaching them English and using the secrets and was asking me some really amazing questions. Um, another one from the United Emirates today. I don't get videos from those areas. And I think that would be an incredible thing, especially for US ELL teachers to see um, just all the different facets of coming at this from a different language. And they're backdoor learners by default. They have to take a backdoor route because they don't have the same front door that we all are used to walking through um, as our SPED learners. So I love, I love, love, love getting those. I hope I'm just overwhelmed with emails from folks with videos uh, this week as you get back into your classrooms from, from what your kids are doing. Uh, okay, I'm gonna try to keep on down here. Pam Miller, we do this to find the leader of the day. Uh, oh, where did that go? Okay. Um, okay, I don't know where that went. You guys have so many questions. I may have to actually, because the more I go down, the more I'm seeing amazing stuff here. So I'm not even gonna get close to getting where I need to go. So I'll tell you what I will do. Um, <laughs> I am gonna, Wow, okay, there's so much here. I'm gonna have to do a whole thing just to talk about these because some of these things are awesome. I mean, I can't even get through them. I do see one thing that I did wanna um, mention here. I saw Terry wrote it. My district told me that I should not introduce the letters until my scope and sequence tells me to. I told them about Katie's buffet method and they had nothing else to say. Oh, good, okay, I didn't read that part. I thought you were gonna say they told you no. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm really glad that they didn't. Um, that's great. I was afraid I was going to take that one on of all the other ones. Um, just keep in mind that districts do mean well when they tell you they don't want you to, you know, just namsy pamsy with the sounds. The reason they say that is they don't want any, they don't want anything missed. And they're afraid if they don't spell out exactly what's supposed to be covered at each grade level, then the ball is going to get dropped and some kids are going to, you know, get out of first and they didn't learn these because that teacher does them in kinder, but this teacher does them in second. And so if you had this teacher and then that teacher, you just missed all 12 of these valuable pieces of the code. So that's why they try to have this uniformity with it. The reason that we escape that rule is we're doing it when no one's supposed to do it. So because kindergarten isn't supposed to have any of these, if you can give it to them then, or if you're in first grade or second grade, you're still going to get, you're, they're going to do every single thing they're supposed to do, but then everything else also. So you don't get into trouble, quote unquote, or have any worries when you're actually doing more than what you have to do. The problem is when you get freedom and flexibility and you do the same or less. But when the whole reason you're, 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 you're going away from that is to actually open up access to everything and accelerate the code. For, for transfer to reading and writing. And that's why we're accelerating it. It's because we need it to transfer to what kids are reading and writing every day. And the only way to do that is for them to have more of the code to, to read and write with. So when districts hear that logical argument and then they see that it's possible, because the next logical question is, well, how would you breathe underwater? Heck, we'd all breathe underwater if we could. Yeah, let's teach all the sounds from pre-K, why not? 
if they don't understand how it's happening, it would seem illogical that it's possible. They'd agree it's great, but it's not possible. So that's where I think the learning curve comes in is understanding how it is possible. You're not really teaching letter sounds. You know, you're just aligning new things to what is already deeply familiar in the learner's framework of understanding which are these social and emotional experiences. Ah, ow! When to be sneaky, when not to be sneaky, what to do when your mom's right there or your babysitter versus when she's too far away to get a hold of you. Those aren't new things, those aren't skills, those aren't phonics things. Those are just what learners already bring to the table and we cheat and we glue those to the stuff that they're not supposed to get for two more years. So when districts start to see how it's working, they're all for it. But initially they have those protective walls up of, you know, first, second, third, you know, scope and sequence in particular order, everybody doing the same thing. Um, but I understand that because, you know, they're in the world where you can't breathe underwater and you need the heavy scuba tank. And when you can breathe underwater, why would you want to lug that thing around? Uh, okay, practice the skill. So all of these, I am going to only because they are so many and they're so good. Um, I just, the only thing I, I actually will also hit here too is one person did say um, that they've combined as phonics first with secret stories, but haven't tried to combine it with zoo phonics. Our preschools in our district just received zoo phonics. Um, you can always, and then another person said the same thing, so zoo phonics will work with secrets or it won't, they weren't sure. You can use the secrets with anything because all the secrets are going to do is power up the stuff that's in your program. The secrets aren't a program. So look at it like this, your program, whether it's Zoophonics, whether it's Foundations, whether it's Letterland, whether it's um, uh, Wilson Phonics, whether it's a reading series, and you don't even have a phonics series. Those are playgrounds that kids can use to play, to flex their reading and writing muscles. The secret stories just make sure they have the absolute strongest, biggest, and baddest reading and writing muscles. So unlike Letterland or Zoophonics or a reading series, The Secret Stories isn't gonna chop up the code and have a kindergarten version and a first grade version and a second grade version because The Secret Stories is gonna give them access to everything by just putting meaning where there wouldn't be. And then you can milk the value out of your program, out of your playground. You know, you can have more fun on the sliding board or going over the monkey bars that Zoophonics offers. Um, every year things come and go. So every so many years, you're going to get a different reading series. You're going to get a different phonics program. Secret stories aren't a program. They're not a playground. They're what kids need inside themselves to be on that playground, to maximize the time spent on that playground. And that playground's your classroom. It's all the reading and writing you're doing across the day. So in order to really get the most value out of what the district buys for you to use, which is your program, you want to have some tools to, to do the reading and writing with. And the more tools you have, the more you can actually do. So yes, it would correlate with all those different programs, but don't worry so much about how do I do it together? Just give the kids what they need to do what you're trying to actually do. So if you're doing something fun with Zoophonics, go ahead and do whatever that is that's fun with Zoophonics, but don't hold up things for the sake of Zoophonics. Meaning if you have a way, if you can do the better alphabet song every day and they can get those letter sounds done in two weeks to two months, don't not do that because you're trying to do your Zoophonics song in first in, in, instead. In other words, don't block a skill because you're trying to do this instead of that. Always keep your eye on, well, what's the goal of the game? What am I trying to do? If what you're trying to do is in this case, teach those individual letters and sounds, do what's gonna make that happen quicker, faster, stronger. Once they have those, they'll be able to really dive deep into some of the activities, the games, the songs, the fun that Zoophonics offers, as well as the reading series or anything else. So you never really have to worry about contradicting it. It's more just pulling tools. Those are all tools. They're all playgrounds to explore but you do want as much strength as you can muster to maximize your fun on those playgrounds. Um, okay, and yes, they uh, always put, I see the thing about putting them all up, uh, putting it up like a buffet because they get really excited and wonder about the ones they don't know. Jamie said, I like rewarding kids every so often by letting them choose a secret for me to teach. They love them. That's awesome. And one teacher told me this and I will actually uh, probably end with this because no matter how darn I try to, not go over, I can't help it. Um, one teacher told me that she, and this was at that conference in, in California, she, and she's gonna send me a video, she promised. She assigns at the beginning of the year, each kid his own secret. They are the secret keeper of that secret. And this just kind of goes along with what 
the person was saying about um, letting them pick a secret to, to hear. That's like their reward. They can pick anyone. And I love that idea, by the way. It's like picking the present you want to open on Christmas Eve. You just get to pick one on Christmas Eve. I love that like a reward could be you get to pick one secret. And I promise whatever it is, I will tell you. I think that's an incredible idea. It just hit me actually what that was um, because it made me think of this other thing that I'm going to tell you, which is a keeper of the secret. Another teacher um, had said she assigns a secret to each child at the beginning of the year. So every child is the keeper of one secret and that is that kid's secret. So when it is told, when that secret gets told, that kid, that 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 student is the owner, the expert on that secret. And anytime anybody can't read a word with his secret in it, he's gonna step up and make sure you've got what you need to figure it out. If he has to tell it, if he has to retell it, if he has to help you dramatize it, it is his baby, it is his secret. He is the resident expert, it's like NASA. You know, every, everybody's got their own little niche that they're in charge of. Well, I am the E-R-I-R-U-R expert, or I know everything there is to know about OUS. So I loved that idea because I thought, what a great way to really get kids to, to collaborate um, and work together. And also, again, get excited about secrets, especially if you're one that doesn't get to know your secret for a while, that's going to drive you out of your mind. Um, so that's a good thing, too, because there's more fun and anticipation to introduce them. Um, but I love that way. And I don't even remember who mentioned that. I'll go back in the chats and see, because I think that's a great reward. It's an amazing reward idea to let a kid pick a secret, anyone they want to know. And that really is fun if you've set it up as these are grown up reading and writing secrets. And I could never tell you one that your brain wasn't ready for or your brain could explode. And I don't want that to happen. I mean, I've never even told my second graders a secret like this until like the end of the year. I don't even know if I told them that at the end of the year, it's just so big. I just, I don't know if you're ready for it. I mean, you're really smart. I don't know if I have to think about this. So when you really build it up that these are, you know, something that you've got and they want, you'll decide if they can have it. Wow, what a cool reward that would be if they could just pick anyone and you have to tell them what it is. That's such a cool idea. Anyway, I am so, so thrilled that you are joining me tonight. I was petrified that over the holiday weekend, I'd be here by myself. So I'm so grateful uh, for you to spend your time. And I promise I'm gonna do one episode. It won't be next week's because I wanna make sure I get these together with the Better Alphabet song, but I will do one episode where I do nothing but comb through the questions that I haven't touched on or have never mentioned or answered or said anything related to them. And I will by name say who it is and what it is and I will cover it. And by the way, almost everything that I'm asked the most is gonna be captured tonight on Facebook at 7 p.m. when a video goes live that is myself and Jen Foster, who's the teacher in Malaysia, who she's a millennial. She knows everything about Instagram. I am clueless. She is teaching me and I try so hard not to screw it up. And she said, why don't we put these most likely asked questions? Cause she had a ton that she brought to the table. And I said, you know, those are the ones I hear most often, plus these two. And she said, well, how about this? Don't tell me the answers because we're collaborating on her journey. She said, don't tell me the answers. Let me ask you the question. And then you tell me the answer in the video. And she said, the only thing is to fit on Instagram, you can't talk more than 59 minutes, <laughs> which I thought, well, then this won't work. This is just not possible to do this. So she said, oh, sure it is. You can do it. And so I did. So she asked me questions in under 30 seconds and I answered them in under one minute. And we slung shot through about 10 of them. And I think the first five are the ones that you're gonna see tonight. You can see the intro to it is already posted on Facebook. So on that note, I will let you go. And thank you so much for joining me. Please feel free to put any questions you have or that you would like me to hit in the comments below. Or if you want Jen to incorporate them into her high tech um, Instagram, Facebook interviewee thing, you can put the comment right under the interview uh, video that you'll see on Facebook. And uh, she's going to incorporate that plus a whole bunch more that she got from Instagram where she asks me and I answer. So that's another way you can get those answers uh, really fast. Thanks so much. Good night. I hope you have a great holiday and uh, lots of tools to play with on Monday. And I'll see you next week at 5 p.m. Uh, live. Same place, same time. Thanks. Bye.